Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Golden Astrologer podcast. This is Deb McBride broadcasting from lovely Escazú, Costa Rica, where it is Sunday, December 6, 2020, and the year is just flying. It's over practically. We have a few more weeks left, and it's just unbelievable how quickly this year has gone despite the drama and the problems and the issues and all and this is so the, the the final stretch of the year and a lot a lot is still going to happen in this intense year of 2020 the first thing is that um you know we've been talking a lot about the eclipses and all the the next eclipse is the solar eclipse new moon next Monday the 14th. So here we are in the week. This is the week between the eclipses. Last week we had an eclipse on Monday the 30th. And now we are gearing up for another eclipse because they always at least come in pairs. Sometimes there's three as there were back in June and July. So here we are and we are having the second eclipse a week from tomorrow. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to sit back and relax and nothing's going to happen. We're gearing up for the next eclipse. This eclipse is at 23 degrees of Sagittarius, okay? And eclipses occur when the sun and the moon are crossing the paths of the nodes. And the nodes are in Sagittarius and Gemini. Gemini is where the north node is. The south node is in Sagittarius. Now, this eclipse is more powerful than the last eclipse because this one is closer to the node. So the node right now is about 19 degrees of Sagittarius. That is the south node. And the eclipse is going to occur at 23 degrees of Sagittarius. So that's the sun and the moon lining up at 23 degrees Sagittarius, and Mercury is going to be very close. Mercury will be about 20 degrees of Sag at the time. So Mercury is really part of this eclipse, um, as it was back in January when we had Mercury in line up with the sun and the moon and <laughs> Saturn and Pluto. Uh, so let's not even go back to that again. <laughs> We know what this year's been like. So anyway, one of the things that's important to recognize, um, it occurs at 11, 17 a.m. Eastern time. One of the things that it's important to realize is that this is a south node eclipse. And that means we're finishing something. We're escorting something out of our lives or we're becoming aware of something that needs to go, or we're finishing a job, or we're, we're finishing something karmic, um, but it's something closing the door, some door. So that's actually, you know, an important thing to remember. North node eclipses is what we had last time, you know, two, a week ago. That north node eclipse was, in, you know, the, the moon was what was being eclipsed. And the north node is in Gemini, so the moon was in Gemini. And so what was being eclipsed was the moon rather than the sun, which was at the south node or close to the south. They were, Neither one of them were on top of the nodes. Um, but this one is closer to the node and therefore more intense and more powerful. So what I expect is that if you aren't already feeling it, then you're going to start feeling it towards the end of the week when, especially when the moon goes into Sag next Saturday, the 12th, but it's at night. So, you know, right now the moon's in Virgo, so it's going to travel through a quarter of the zodiac this week. So it's Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and then it goes into Sag. And um, so this is an interesting lead up to the eclipse. There's not going to be another eclipse after this um so we're done and then the lunation that kicks out the eclipse period is the following lunation which is the full moon on the 29th of december at eight degrees of cancer so what's really going on 
is that we are um, experiencing sort of a heightened sense of energy. Now, Sagittarius is about the law. It's about publishing. It's about travel, foreign travel particularly. It's about good fortune. It is about uh, the justice system. It is about the experience of education, particularly higher education and um, publishing. And um, Sagittarians love to expand their world. So um, this is, an ex it can be ex considered expansive, you know, um, this is not something that occurs every day. And so it is ruled by Jupiter. But when the eclipse occurs, Jupiter will still be in Capricorn at the end of Capricorn. And so everything kind of refers back to Saturn. Now, um, next week is really huge. You know, this coming week, we're getting a little bit of a reprieve. But next week is really huge because two planets change signs and we have an eclipse and it's it's a major, major event. Um, so in the meantime, where is the Sagittarius part of your chart? What house is Sagittarius? Where is your Jupiter? What are you feeling? Are you feeling like, hmm, you want to educate yourself more you want to stop your education you want to give up education you um you know i've heard people say a lot lately that they want justice for certain things and you know that's a part of sagittarius as well it's a very libran thing also libra and sagittarius are concerned with justice and the law libra's more they want to see fairness sag is more justice and so when we have this eclipse next week, um, you know, it's, you know, it's an intense, intense amount of energy um, in one spot of the zodiac. So 23 degrees Sag, where does that fall in your chart? If you are a Sagittarius, you're going to feel this. You're going to feel this very profoundly. If your birthday is you know, this week, the end of the week, early next week, you are, you are getting an eclipse at your birthday. So that's also very profound. But remember, the word eclipse is like something's being covered. So, you know, it's a solar eclipse and it's the sun. It's the radiance of the sun. But the sun is, you know, being our life force and all, but it is also, you know, if it's in Sag... It's the, it's the area of good fortune and optimism and, you know, those other things I mentioned, justice and the law and publishing. And, and, um, and I mean the law in the sense of the study of law, the practice of law. Um, and, and so there's not rules like in Capricorn, you know. Um, there's this experience of the sun being covered over by the moon and one of the things you know the moon is also going to occult mercury in the wee hours of the day that day eastern time and so it's really an occultation an occultation is when something gets covered um the moon usually often makes occultations and it it will make one with mercury and will make one with uh the sun, which is the eclipse. Now, that's all the same day. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, um, occultations usually mean we don't see something. We aren't seeing something clearly. We Things are happening veiled. They're behind a curtain. And when the moon moves off the sun and away from the sun, then the sun can do its thing again. It can shine. And we are not blinded. And we are not, uh, so what's interesting is Mercury is going to be the first planet that's occulted and then the sun, because it's an eclipse. And what this says to me is there's information that is not being shared or not being seen. So next weekend is actually very interesting because the 12th on Saturday, the moon will occult Venus. And that's at 3.59 p.m. Um because, you know, it's going to pass in front of Venus, and in this case, it's going to occult Venus. So 
there might be a moment in that, that's 359 uh, Eastern time, that we might not feel love or friendship or camaraderie or you might feel a little bit besmirched <laughs> by someone that you love. And so that's, uh, you know, Venus is in Scorpio, the moon is going to besmirch it <laughs> in the afternoon. And uh, so that's a little bit mm, of like sort of a slight. Then the next day, Mercury is going to square the 13th, which is next Sunday. Mercury is going to square Neptune, which is always a confusing aspect. And then we go into the eclipse. And so, you know, what's happening is that there's like this absence of information. There's this absence of love. There's this confusion around information that's happening at this eclipse. And one would hope that the eclipse kind of clears these things up as it moves. Now, in the week prior, in our week that we're going into now, um, it's really a lot of activity between the sun and 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 the moon doing things so the sun is going to square neptune on wednesday so the sun in sagittarius will square neptune on wednesday so that's a little you know that can be a little confusion um illusion delusion and sagittarius is a very optimistic sign and sagittarius they're the people that rush the light they're the ones, I'm going to make the light before it changes. And they're rushing their light, okay? Those are the, that's, that's the energy of Sagittarius. I'm fortunate, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to rush the light. And that's sometimes not correct. <laughs> and they take risks. They're the risk taker of the Zodiac. And they just they're just like, hey, you know, well, if something, if I have an accident, I have an accident. I'm going to, but I'm going to make this light. But it's squaring Neptune. So the judgment might be off. So if you feel people's judgment is, it's just such a crazy time. Nine, the 9th of December is, the moon is going to be in Libra and the sun in Sag is squaring Neptune. So to me, there's like this, there's this imbalance of justice or this this imbalance of correct information or like I'm going to rush my light and I'm being fooled <laughs> by doing so you know I'm I'm fooling myself so clarity is of the utmost importance as we go into this eclipse as we go into this week because sun squaring neptune and then mercury squaring neptune a few days later you know on the 13th this is really about, you know, maybe getting secrets revealed or keeping secrets or um, being, uh, you know, sort of in a sense of illusion. Um, it, it's great for meditation. It's great for creative arts and practices, writing music, anything like that is really very, very uh, profoundly helpful Um to use up that Neptunian energy. If you're a songwriter, if you are uh, a dancer, if you're an artist, if you're someone who's in the arts and you're tapping into your psychic energy and all, it's it's what you want to be tapping into. It's how you want to tap into your meditation, the power of your meditation, the synchronicities that occur due to your meditations. And that's how this energy should be used. Um, that's the most positive part instead of deluding yourself instead of living in illusion instead of fooling people instead of tricking people or fooling yourself the best thing you can do is really work with like the the upper <laughs> the upper atmosphere the 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 experience of the psychic realms because we are getting a good amount of energy towards neptune and neptune had just gone direct a few weeks ago so this is important to recognize. Um, so there's the sun squaring Neptune, and then the moon will um, trine Neptune on the 12th, and then before it occults Venus. And then it's going, we're going to have Mercury square Neptune on the day before the eclipse. And then the day of the eclipse, the, you know, the moon will be in Sag, and it will square Neptune. So, um, it's, it's actually very interesting. So my advice is meditate. <laughs> and that's going to help you get through this eclipse if nothing else will. You know, 
it changes everything. People, I've heard testimonies time and again, people say, you know, when I started meditating, my life really changed it. And they were able to direct their energy and direct their attention to something positive and clarity in their lives as opposed to, you know, just sort of being in a place of uh, confusion and illusion. So you want to navigate that Neptune. You want to navigate that Neptune. In the meantime, um... There is, a, the moon is opposing Neptune tomorrow, so Neptune gets a lot of activity this week. And then Thursday, Venus is going to speak to Pluto in a very nice way. And that's good. That's good. Venus and Pluto should talk to each other nicely. Um, and that's good for relationships. It's good for finances. It's good for friendships and all. And then the sun, because it's in Sag, is trining Mars. Um, on Friday the 11th. Now, we've had an interesting aspect the last couple of days because the, today the moon's in Virgo since 2.46 p.m. Eastern Time. But we had the moon in Leo Friday, Saturday, and it was void from yesterday to, through this afternoon, almost 24 hours. But, you know, what was great was that the moon was making really good aspects to Mars, it was making a trine to Mars, and it was making a trine to the sun. And, you know, even though, like, it was a little tense with Venus, yesterday there were some, you know, this is a really good grand trine in fire. So there was really good energy to get moving and to be doing things and to be connecting with um, your fiery spirit and your get up and go. So, yeah, if you had holiday tasks to do, if you had some work to do, if you had projects to do or you just wanted to like be out and about and exercising and all this is really this was a good time to do that so um sure you know it, the grand trine and fire really helps you get up and get things done now in between now in the eclipse so we're going to have this nice talk with venus and pluto and we are going to also have Venus talking sweetly to Jupiter on the day of the eclipse. So that's going to help things because Jupiter rules the eclipse. Now, um, so I always give warnings, you know, at eclipses. Um, they bring emotions to the table. And it may be the end of something. It may be like where you've realized or you've become enlightened to something. And you really feel like you need to change something. And that's why it's often you know, the South Node Eclipse is often about endings. So this is really something important that we pay attention to the fact that we may want to let something go. And it doesn't mean it's something of great importance to us that, oh my God, I have to, I must let something go. No, you, you can navigate. Remember, you know, we're still dealing with Neptune too, and we've got to navigate that Neptune. Um, and it's really a a time of intense emotional energy. So please, once again, you know, Sag <laughs> wears their foot well in their mouth. <laughs> no offense, Sagittarians, but they can blurt out something, um, be a little overconfident, be a little brazen. You remember, they rush their light. And they might say something that they want to take back. And so this is really important to pay attention to. Watch your tone, watch your mouth, watch your thoughts, and just don't get yourself into um, emotional trouble. Meaning, you know, don't if, if it's a tense situation and you have to talk about it, then do it by all means, of course. But if it's something that can wait, don't, 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 don't. Just don't even start, you know. If it's something that can escalate, Please, by no means, start the con don't start the conversation. By no means, you know, don't start it. Don't do it. Wait till after the eclipse because we we tend to get wrapped up in our emotions. And even if the most evolved person who meditates all the time and, and is very grounded, they can get very wrapped up in their emotions during this time. And I think it's important to not allow that to happen. So it's really nice to work through the eclipse, 
see what it means for you. Do a ceremony. It's a new moon. The class that I teach, we're all interested in doing like um, rituals at the new moon. We do seven candle ceremonies and they're, they're always really fun and they are helpful. And these people have gotten really good at manifesting things. And it's great. Um, the more you do it, the more the universe listens. And so, you know, we like to do these. Now, um, one of the things that I also need to talk about is this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. And that is coming the following Monday. So, as I said, we're not finished. This month is is going to be really intense. because. But next week we have an eclipse on Monday. By Thursday, Saturn will have left Capricorn and go into Aquarius for good for the next two and a half to three years. And Jupiter on Saturday the 19th will have left Capricorn and won't come back for, you know, 12, 13 years. It goes into Aquarius. And so they're both going into Aquarius and that's going to happen between the time, like we have the eclipse and then boom, this happens. And then the two of them meet very early zero degrees Aquarius on the winter solstice on the 21st. And Mars is getting revved up to square Pluto which will happen on the 23rd. So, you know, this is going to be an interesting holiday season. Um, One of the things that's, uh, so there's a couple, obviously a couple things that are really important. Remember all along, I have talked about the Saturn-Jupiter, the Jupiter-Saturn cycle, and it's every 20 years. And people born in the zero year, for the most part, zero and sometimes the, you know, like 1980, 81, 1960, 61, oftentimes what happens is... Um, you know, they not, it depends on when they're born in that year, they get the Jupiter Saturn conjunction in their chart and they have significant events happen to them when Jupiter Saturn occurs. So if you're born in one of those years, 2000, you know, and you're a 20 year old or, you know, in 1980 or 1960, you or 1940, you are going to feel this Jupiter Saturn. And it's what we call a recurrence in astrology. Now, there are some very important details, and I'm going to keep talking about this. I'll talk about it next week because it'll be the day after, you know, that I have my podcast will be the day after. And then uh, it's still going to be in effect. It's not like, okay, Jupiter, Saturn's over. They conjunct. We can go back to life now. No, there's something, there's the end of an era. And there's usually something that happens. And with an eclipse and then the Jupiter, Saturn, something important usually occurs where that says to us, ah, that that show is over. That movie is done. We're we're moving on to like, you know, something else now. And it's in some ways it's the way fads come in and out, you know. Um, but it's also important because this is what we call the Great Conjunction. It only happens every twenty years. Now, with the exception of the anomaly of nineteen eighty eighty one, when Jupiter and Saturn were in Libra, and they conjunct in Libra three times between nineteen eighty and eighty one. This is, um, this was, you know, that that was an anomaly. This has been about 200 years. I did not go back and do the research on how many anomalies there were, but I think there were very few. 200 years of Jupiter and Saturn being in Earth signs. And then now Jupiter and Saturn are squaring, are, are not squaring, they are conjunct, and they are coming into Aquarius, which is an air sign. The next one in 2040, we'll see Jupiter and Saturn in Libra. Now we are in the pattern of air signs. So for 200 years, Jupiter and Saturn met every 20 years in an earth sign, except 1980. And in now 2020, it's switching elements. So, you know, there's earth, air, fire, water. It left earth. It's now going into air. And so all these Jupiter Saturns are going to be in air. And so this marks a big turning point because Jupiter and Saturn are now meeting in air. And they are, you know, like I've said before, they are sort of opposites of one another. Jupiter's optimistic. Saturn is pessimistic. Jupiter's expansive. Saturn contracts. Jupiter is the antidote to Saturn. Saturn's the antidote to Jupiter. You know, when Jupiter gets too grandiose, Saturn tempers the ego and says, "Mm -mm -mm -mm, you can't rush that light. You got to you got to calm down here and be focused and committed. When Saturn gets too depressed or pessimistic or 
ornery. Jupiter is the antidote and it opens up the door and says, you've got to believe. You have to have faith. You must have faith. And Saturn says, I, I can't, just can't believe in that. I don't see it. I need to see it in my reality. And Jupiter says, no, you must have faith that it's going to come in your reality. And that's the balance of the two of them. And they work together and we need to work with both of them. So if there's something in your life that you believe wholeheartedly in, but you're, you know, you're like, uh, I, I got my doubts. You have to have faith. You can't lose faith right now. You know, you really, you really can't lose faith, but you need to be cautiously optimistic. So that's, that's the theme, but they are a big deal because there are some people who are born with this pattern and they live a very healthy, happy life. And, you know, but there are iconic people, um, that often experience something really major in their life when the Jupiter Saturn happens again and they had a Jupiter Saturn. They're born with a Jupiter Saturn. So, you know, we had, we've had numerous like examples where I've, I've said John Lennon is the poster child for this because he was born in 1940 with an exact Jupiter Saturn. He became famous and started to become really famous in 1960, 61 under the next Jupiter Saturn when he was 20 years old. And then he died when he was 40 at the following Jupiter Saturn, which was in 1980. Um, that's not a long life, you know, um, but he's forever etched in our memories and in our hearts. John F. Kennedy Jr., you know, it's interesting, you know, he's on, so people are remembering him now, magazines are putting him on the covers and stuff uh, because it, he would be turning 60 about now because he was born in 1960 and he, his Jupiter and his Saturn are both in Capricorn. They're about 10 degrees apart, but he passed away under the Jupiter Saturn. Uh, it wasn't fully conjunct yet, but it was right before the Jupiter Saturn of, of 19, of the year 2000. He's died in 1999. So he was an iconic person. And so it, he, he was like the end of an era. John Lennon was the end of an era. Think about those people and what they meant to society and to culture and what happened as a result. And so there is the chance that something similar will happen again. I am not a doomsday uh, kind of person. I don't predict death. I couldn't even imagine right now anyone as adored as either of those men in our culture right now. So let's see what happens. Um, it could be something out of the blue. Aquarius is, is a sign ruled by Uranus and it comes out of the blue. Whatever, sometimes with Aquarius, it's a surprise. And I looked at the chart of the exact moment that Jupiter Saturn happens and Uranus is on the ascendant. So something, something is going to surprise us about this and it's going to be a twist. There's a twist in all of this. Okay. Um, so there is a twist. Now people get hung up on the sign of Aquarius Aquarius is revolution. Aquarius is science, technology. Aquarius is uh, a bit contrary. You know, Aquarius is about brotherhood. My teacher used to say, Aqu Aquarians love humanity. It's the people they hate because <laughs> they tend to be loners or they can be loners, but they do need a community. Aquarians need a community. Um, I'm an Aquarius. I understand Aquarius very well. And we look for the different. We look for the innovative. We look for the, the different path. We don't want to do what everybody else is doing. And that is the nature of Uranus, and that is the nature of Aquarius. So there is a twist here. Oh, she's different. Oh, she's kooky. Oh, she's retro. Oh, that's an Aquarius, okay? Aquarius can be chilly. They're an air sign. They are ruled by intellect and science and astrology <laughs> and um, you know, if you're a person like me who has Venus and Pisces, then, you know, that's a different story. That's a little bit, you know, that brings in the, the heart center thing. But many times Aquarian energy is revolutionary and they are, they turn things upside down. The United States chart of 1776 has the moon in Aquarius. And so that was born out of a revolution, Right. So there is a revolution in the air and um, 
but it is not the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And I said this in my Instagram the other day. <laughs> and those of you who are tired of hearing me say this, I have seen this all over the internet. And this is starting the Aquarian age for sure. No, <laughs> no, this is not. because This is just because these two planets are in Aquarius together does not mean we are starting the Aquarian age. This is something to do with the procession of the equinoxes. That's an age. We, the Piscean age started around the time of Christianity. We are making a transition into the Aquarian age um, from the Piscean age. It goes backwards. It's the wobble of the earth that determines this 26,000 year uh, cycle of the ages of, of one great year. Look at a YouTube video by David Cochrane. It's 23 minutes long. It's about the procession of the equinoxes. And he explains it very well. He's an astrologer. Um, but uh, Aquarius is about technology. It's not going to be some golden age, you know. Um, it's about technology. It's about science. It's about, you know, being a little cool and aloof. And that is the nature of Aquarius. When uh, they wrote that musical back in the 60s, <laughs> They used it as poetic license, and it was not something that they were predicting. That astrology in that song is poetic license. It doesn't work that way. Astrology doesn't work the way they described. They were just, you know, having fun. You know, it's, it's a Broadway musical. Um, in any respect. Um, so, at a, the age of Aquarius, my teacher would say, began the first time a phone rang anywhere, which was probably Alexander Graham Bell's office. But also, um, we are in a transition from the Piscean Age to the Aquarian Age. So an age is, I mean, th there's lots and lots of views on when this is going to start. And because of the technology, and, you know, we're still very much, there's still very much a religious world. Uh, Christianity is still very much alive and well. And this is something that, we need to pay attention to because that's Piscean. The groovy business, the peace and love, that's Pisces. Aquarius is brotherhood and humanitarianism and altruism. But peace and love is not necessarily, Aquarius is revolution, not peace. Aqu Pisces is peace, you know. Um, they want peace. Libras want peace. They want peace and serenity. You know, Libras. This is not the dawning of the age of Libra, <laughs> you know. Um, but Pisceans want peace and serenity. And Aquarians want to, you know, excite things and electrify things. This is not peace and love. You know, that's not what this is about. So when people think of the age of Aquarius, don't think this is going to be some golden age of peace and love. It's going to be, you know, the golden age of technology and science. And science may replace a lot of beliefs. And that's one of the things that we're already seeing. So we're making a transition. Uh, you know, often, I guess, in astrology, we say it's not going to happen for at least another hundred years or more. There are other views of this when the Aquarian age might be begin I read something on Wikipedia earlier where it, they said 3575 the year 3575 I think that's a little long um, uh, considering the Piscean age began at the beginning of Christianity um, but in any respect so this is just a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in Aquarius they are changing elements we will expect some sort of twist in our life and an end of an era and a story and pay attention and you know what? Send some really good energy out there. Meditate, send vibes, and send good energy. That's a good use of Aquarius. Aquarius is a higher level thinking. Think about the, the world, the universe at large, and send some good energy and um, focus, you know, some positive thoughts towards mankind. That's what you need to do, you know? Um you know, just, and stay positive yourself. Aquarius can be very positive and innovative. And so just be aware of that. Just send humanity some good thoughts because right now humanity needs it. So 
on that note, we will talk more about this next week and in the coming weeks. And on my Instagram, if you don't know my Instagram, it's The Golden Astrologer. And my website is thegoldenastrologer.com if you'd like to book an appointment with me. Especially, this is a great time to book an appointment. Where is a Sagittarius eclipse happening for you? Where is this Saturn-Jupiter happening in your chart? Where's Aquarius in your chart? Come see me and we'll talk all about it and we'll discuss where... This is happening for you, so you're aware of how to use this energy. Um, it's going to go on for a little while. And my Twitter is at Deb Astrology, and I suggest that you pay close attention to the skies because you'll be able to see Saturn and Jupiter joining in the heavens. So m- great good fortune to you this week. Much gratitude to all of you for listening, and I thank you, and we will see you on the heels of the eclipse next week. Have a good week.